Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining our webinar uh, today, hunting for the next winners uh, using a quantitative approach to navigating uh, the markets and fundamental analysis. Before we start, um, my name is Stephanie Greiner. I'm with Refinitiv as part of the solution consulting team. Um, before we begin, there's just a few technical and housekeeping items that I'd like to go through for the webinar. Uh, first, there is no dial-in number for audio, so please use the device sound on your, de on your device and plug in your headphones uh, or use your speakers to listen to the webinar. You should click on the media player on your screen to enable the sound and video, and please ensure that Flash is enabled on your browser. If for any reason your slides become stuck during the presentation, uh, please just refresh the browser at the bottom of your audio of your audience console screen. You can expand your slide window by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right of the window or by dragging uh, the bottom right corner of the slide area to expand it. If you do have any technical difficulties during the webcast, we do have someone on hand to support you with technical issues uh, specific to the platform, please click on the help widget um, in your audio, uh, your audience console and someone will be um, able to help you. Finally, we, have, uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation portion of the webinar. There is a Q&A box. Um, please feel free to type your questions in there um, and we will answer hopefully all of them, but as many as possible. And any that we don't get to, we certainly will be sure that we answer them uh, via email. And uh, lastly, there will be a link to the recording emailed to you after the conclusion of the webinar, as well as the slides. So that all will be provided to you. Now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Uh, we have two great speakers. First, Tim Gaumer. Tim is a director of fundamental research at Refinitiv. With more than 20 years experience conducting fundamental analysis, Tim is widely regarded as an expert helping fundamental investors apply innovative quantitative research in their investment process. And second, we're pleased to have Yuan Kok. Yuan is a chief investment officer of the RS Invest of the RS Global team and a portfolio manager of the Victory RS Global Fund and Victory RS International Fund. RS Investments was acquired by Victory Capital in July 16 and Victory Capital uh, Investment Franchise. So welcome to both of our speakers. Um, at this point, I will turn it over to Tim Gaumer to start the presentation portion. Thank you, Tim. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Um, try to share slides. Yep. Oh, and Tim, maybe I'll go through the, the we have some poll questions uh, for our audience. Um, so do. maybe before you start, Tim, I'll, I'll go through those poll questions. Um, first, we just want to get a, li a little bit of information uh, from the people that are that have joined our webinar. Um, so perhaps if we could ask you to uh, answer this, these next couple of questions. First one, what, what type of company do you work for? Um, I'll just leave this up here for 10 or so seconds um, and let everybody uh, respond uh, before I move forward to the next question so we can uh, give everybody an opportunity to answer. Okay. Okay, so it seems we uh, have a majority of asset managers, uh, asset owners um, on, on the call with um, a, a few other user types as well. So thank you for that information. Um, the next poll question, um, are you currently incorporating quantitative tools as part of your investment decision making process and workflow? Um, just give few seconds for you to answer that question. And again, this just helps us get an understanding of, of who's on the webinar. Um, and most of you, 75% of you are, uh, so it's, it's great. Um, and then uh, 
at this point now, um, Tim, now that we're through the poll questions, um, I'm ready to, uh, to turn it over to you. So thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so those polling questions are good. So I know now that I don't have to explain what a factor is or what factor-based investing is. It seems like most of you are on board with that. Uh, so what I'll be sharing today is putting that in the context of uh, what's been working well this year. So uh, thinking about new idea generation, whether you're, um, say you're, say quantum mental, uh, some people hate that word, but if you use a quantitative approach for new idea generation uh, to find those companies that are good candidates for additional fundamental research, that's kind of what I'm going to be showing as a use case. So in that context, what factors, what models, what quantitative techniques are working well this year as we start to look at what may be the next winners uh, for the remainder of the year and into next. Uh, so what I've been seeing that some things are in favor, some things are deeply out of favor. So for example, value hasn't been working. Um, hopefully you can see this slide. So this is looking at the Russell 1000 growth index versus the performance of the Russell 1000 value. And you can see the difference in the performance of those two now you know, is extreme. It, it's much higher now than it was at the peak of the dot-com bubble, if you can believe that. So value has been out of favor for quite a while. So as I start to look for new ideas, I'm going to keep growth in mind. Uh, you know, it's not just a U.S. phenomenon. You know, we've been seeing this globally as well. So this is looking MSCI world growth versus value. Very similar pattern. So every month we produce a monthly performance report. I, I actually uh, write this uh, commentary for it. And we look at what factors are working or not working. And when I, I put quotes around working because it doesn't mean that the factors aren't predicting what they were designed to predict. You know, value stocks are still cheaper than growth stocks. Uh, <clears throat> But it doesn't mean that the market is always equally rewarding every kind of investment strategy and every type of factor. Right? So we see here, looking at July, it's representative of what we've been seeing for most of the year, certainly post the March um, bottom. Uh, see trailing 12-month returns, that's a basic measure of momentum, tops the list. Uh, this is looking at information coefficients, the correlation between this factor and market returns. Uh, looking at, this is the top 3,000 companies in the U.S. Um, we see that momentum is working, growth is working well, uh, quality is being rewarded. Um, you know, so this is some insight. If we look at the bottom, you know, it's mostly like valuation factors. So we'll use this to, to build a screen. Also, um, Within StarMine, the, the Icon desktop, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, in Icon, we have a StarMine uh, overview app. And we post monthly live returns here. So we track the performance of our models since they've been released commercially. So it's not just you know historical, back-tested, theoretical. Uh, so this is updated every month. And you can see here what, what's been performing well. And, and in this case, uh, I'm looking at U.S. companies over the trailing 12-month period, uh, the overall market, so the top 3,000 by market cap, uh, I've highlighted this top line. So assuming you're a long-only manager, uh, you can see that relative to the equal weighted average of these 3,000 companies, which is up 8.5% year uh, over the trailing 12 months, earnings quality is up 19%, nicely beating that. Uh, analyst revisions uh, has appreciated almost the same amount. Price momentum is doing really well. You can see valuation is not. So let's build on this observation. On these two different approaches, looking at information coefficients and top 10%, top decile returns, uh, earnings quality, analyst revisions, price momentum, I think it's interesting to note in the price momentum category here, uh, we also have positive top-bottom decile returns. Uh, that 9.2% spread 
easily beats a loss of almost 15% for the benchmark. So we put out a basic benchmark for every one of our models. So in the case of momentum, that's just trailing 12 months return. So our enhancement of a price momentum signal is uh, outperforming that. Um, so I'll try to build a multi-factor model based on these performance observations and um, then build out a screen in ICON and show what stocks bubble up. But before I do that, now I'd like to ask you and, uh, a couple of questions. So I look at these performance numbers once a month. I focus on our own Refinitiv Starmine models. Uh, but you're uh, an industry veteran. You're a practitioner. You're leading a research team. Uh, you look at this, I assume, every day. Are you seeing similar things, different things? You probably also look at different uh, investable universes. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I'm looking at your findings here with great interest. Um, many of us use very similar factors um, on, the, on the quantitative. I call this traditional quant stock selection factors. Many of us uh, would be using using those. Um, and, um, and so there is definitely a, a high correlation or higher than average correlation when looking at what you do versus kind of what we do. We may construct it slightly differently, but certainly the items that we're looking at are similar. So we do see um, that uh, growth gear factors for us um, have certainly outperformed value factors. Um, and it, it, it is true also across um, most of the regions, um, as you well pointed out. Um, and most of these factors are mirroring what's happening, um, you know, uh, uh, based on market conditions and current market environment. The, uh, all the central banks, um, with the exception of Japan, the central banks um, across the different regions are all providing a lot of liquidity in the marketplace just given COVID pandemic and, and the economy in general. Um, and with that, it seems like growth is pretty scarce. And so it's not surprising to us at all that we see that um, there's a certain amount of chasing growth. Um, and so these growth factors are mirroring that, I think, um, just from our observation. Um, Japan is the only beast um, that's a, a little, I call it beast because it really growth and value uh, factors and and their performance there has been more sort of on the mean reversion, I would say, since 2015. Um, and they've been practicing reflationary policies as well, and yet it didn't, doesn't seem to work as well. But I, I definitely agree with you, bottom line, that growth, uh, growth factors seem to be uh, outperforming value factors. Hmm. It's interesting what you say about Japan. We find that, yeah, Japan trades Unlike um, any other region, uh, it's kind of its own thing. It, it's usually uncorrelated even to what we're seeing in like developed Asia. Uh, so we yeah. break it out as its own separate region where, when we do uh, performance reporting. Right, we do exactly the same. You, 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 ha you almost have to. Uh, you know, the, the, the type of companies, the corporate governance policies, they're, they're all different there, uh, demographics, population wise. Um, although the pursuit of how they've gone about trying to reflate has been similar. So using very strong, aggressive monetary policies, et cetera. Uh, but for some reason, the factors are not as stable there. Yeah, we, we see exactly the same thing. Um, always a, a bit hard to explain, but I think you hit on some of the major differences. Um, so I, I'm so pleased to have you here today because in what's a relatively young sort of um, investment practice of quantitative uh, factors, um, you're, you're an industry veteran, right? So I know you came to us from, well, you came to RS Investments uh, from BGI or from BlackRock. Um, so BGI back in the day, as I understand it, was Barclays Global Investors uh, or Investments. Uh, so BGI was acquired by BlackRock. And I read an interview in the Financial Times a while back, maybe a couple of years ago now, uh, where the chairman said BGI was the best acquisition BlackRock has ever made. Right. So just to get at this group of quantitative researchers. Um, so you've been watching this space for a long time. What what seems the same? What what's different? Uh, how has it evolved over the time you've been following it? 
So I, I think, as I was saying, you know, what's been the same is that the factors, the traditional quant factors are still very much at play. Um, a lot of systematic investing, uh, smart beta ETFs, those are still very much utilizing uh, many of the uh, factors that we're currently talking about today. I would say what's evolved is now, you know, um, trying to uh, increase um, active, quantitative active, uh, by by basically introducing perhaps more uh, machine learning, uh, you know, text mining type um, analysis into the mix um, to to be different or to try to differentiate from you know the, the next font person uh, beside beside you. Uh, for us ourselves. Um, I'm, I'm finding that how, how I've evolved um, is that I've util continued to utilize uh, BGI's construction techniques and alpha you know, implementation techniques, but um, I've introduced fundamental analysts onto, onto my team. Um, very, very important because of the uh, data interpretation and data quality checks and uh, you know, expert sort of industry uh, experience uh, to complement the models. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're finding much the same. So we're using uh, text mining and machine learning to, uh, we find it's good for event prediction. So we have a credit default model that builds on unstructured text. Um, we're also doing some research into um, modeling the probability of M&A, you know, what companies may be the target of an acquisition. And so we find that text mining is, um, is good for uh, event prediction, a little tougher for, you know, correlating directly with price changes. There's so many things that influence price change. Um, right. So um, let me switch to a live demo here and let's use a, a few of these quantitative traditional models, um, much like you said. And, you know, so as we try to prepare for what might be interesting companies to apply that human overlay onto because yeah, we're doing things with artificial intelligence and machine learning too, but there's still a lot of things that humans are good at that, you know, we're still a ways from having the computer uh, beat us at. I'm a CFA charter holder, so I still think analysts add value. Um, let me try a screen share here. There's always a bit of delay in bringing this up, so uh, bear with me for a moment. Now I'm going to ask you the $65 million question here. How did you uh, how did you choose? Oh, are, I know, actually I do know how you you chose the factors. You you picked the ones that have done well. But are you are you introducing an element of dare I say factor timing here, in your in your model choices? Oh yes, I am. Uh, always a bit <laughs> dangerous. Um, you know, just like chasing any kind of performance. Uh, chasing which factors are performing well right now. Uh, there is an element of danger to it. I still believe in reversion to the mean. And when you look at that extreme outperformance of growth versus value, you know, we could be on the cusp of a reversal where you start to see value stocks outperform or more cyclical companies doing better than tech stocks. Um, but there, you know, we're trying not to buck the, the headwind right now in this. Uh, so, you know, you probably want to do this on a fairly regular basis. Uh, we actually did some research as the Stormine Research Quant team uh, a few years ago, trying to build a dynamic factor model, uh, one that would you know, do factor timing automatically. Uh, some moderate degree of success in a couple of markets, but not globally. Um, you know, it looked like if you're going to try to time one factor, Looking at momentum in the context of uh, like economic macro indicators uh, looked like it was the most promising, but it couldn't consistently outperform a static combination. So instead, we bought a we built a regionally optimized combined alpha model, which takes all of the Starmine alpha models, puts them together in a, a scheme that weights the various factors based on what typically works best in each region. For example, emerging markets seems to always be driven more by momentum, whereas Japan is more of a, a value market. Um, yeah. But it was really hard to outperform that um, you know, static combination. 
In, in fact, um, more recently, looking at the, the big downturn, you know, and uh, putting the brakes on the economy suddenly like we just did back in sort of March, April, we tried to build a resiliency model, looking at financial resiliency of companies. You know, we saw a bunch of energy companies suddenly, you know, in danger of bankruptcy because they had very bloated balance sheets with lots of leverage. And we said, okay, let, let's try to build a model that's predictive of a company's ability to sustain a high return on assets over various economic cycles. Uh, turns out we were pretty successful at creating a model that would predict the resiliency of ROA, but we couldn't beat our combined alpha model in terms of price performance. Uh, so the problem was, as we came out of the bottom and sort of after March 24th, uh, there was a big dead cap bounce. You know, you saw a lot of heavily shorted stocks getting squeezed. Uh, a lot of companies that looked like they were in danger of bankruptcy suddenly getting reversed uh, as the Fed, you know, applied more liquidity. Remember, Hertz filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and the stock went up fourfold after its filing. Strange things like that were happening. And so... Uh, even yeah. with uh, a cycle that was very visible to us, we weren't able to, you know, time factors mm -hmm. very well. Um, but yeah. I'll try to do that now. Mm -hmm. Just looking at those things that have worked well in terms of, you know, looking at a new idea. Uh, what's to have a tailwind instead of a, a headwind? So mm -hmm. this is looking at our QA point application. This is a... Um, uh, Backtester in the cloud. It's a browser-based points-and-click backtesting tool designed by our partner, Elson. Um, so this is looking at our analyst revisions model. I'll look at a regional rank. Uh, I'm going to put in like raw scores because this is a 1 to 100 regional relative percentile rank. So we've got the numbers already lined up. Go look at earnings quality. You know, quality has been working well. Uh, I smile when I think about having you on here, UN, because uh, I remember that, you know, one of the luminaries at BGI, um, Richard Sloan, uh, back mm -hmm. during his academic years, uh, created the accruals anomaly, you know, discovered that one, which forms the basis for our earnings quality model. And the reason I joined Starmine when it was privately held FinTech back in the days to help build out this model. Um, now I'm putting in an element of growth. Remember that growth factor that's working so well. So here I'm looking at the IBIS estimates for revenue growth. So I don't want to just look at companies that are growing because they're slashing costs and able to grow EPS through that and buybacks. I want some top line growth as well. So I can build a customized multi-factor models here with this factor model feature, and then I can test it. So we know these are working well individually. The point of this is to see if we can do better by putting them into a combination model. So I'm looking at that on the S&P 500, five fractiles. So in this case, that would be quintiles. So, you know, um, top 20% versus bottom 20%. Uh, because the S&P 500 is, you know, only 500 or so stocks, 505, I believe, symbols. Uh, so we want good-sized portfolios. But if you were running this on a broader index, you know, like if you had a global mandate, you probably want to use deciles, so 10 fractiles. So here are the results. Uh, so the top 20% of the S&P 500 by our multi-factor model is beating the equal weighted universe, which is down three and a half percent. So this is up 5.52 percent. The bottom group is underperforming the universe, down 7.82 percent, dramatically underperforming the weighted benchmark return. So top bottom decile returns here, if you're running a long short hedge fund strategy, would have been 11.85 percent annualized with a decent sharp ratio, but let's see if we can build on that. So I'm going to go back to our factor model. 
you go add in factor, momentum has been working well, right? You can find all kinds of things in here, but an easy way to find star mine models. I'm stressing my bandwidth here. Your star mine should populate here in just a second. It's not a problem with QA point. This is the problem with running video, audio on 24, icon, and the browser at the same time. I'll give it one more try, otherwise I have a slide back up. <laughs> you say you you have your when you when you looked at the the factors. Oh, so, so most of our factors, that's a great question, uh, go back to 1998 in terms of data. Uh, it gets a little less reliable after that. Um, but yeah. the, um, the, the test I'm running here was looking at since January 1, 2000. So I said, let's see what's working well okay. this year when thinking about what to add yeah. next. Okay, so it looks like I was able to add price momentum to that. I'll save it. And try to back test it now by adding in price momentum to the mix. It's so generally a good idea. Go. I like that. Sorry, say that again. Oh, I, I was just it, remarking that generally it is a good idea to add, you know, some form of uh, price momentum into your mix of, of uh, multi-factor model because it, it uh, does help mitigate from uh, quite a few studies that we've done ourselves as well as academics. Um, it will help mitigate value traps or any sort of balance sheet distress um, if you're using other accounting items in your in your model. Oh yeah, that's a great point. And I'm going to try to do that with um, with the screen I build as well. Sorry, this is the same result before, so it, it doesn't look like my uh, my changes here. Um, can you see the slide? It doesn't look like it can. So I'll try to show you this on a slide here. It'll probably just take a, a second to, to come up. The slide is visible, Tim. Great, thanks. So this is showing you know, what I was uh, trying to do live there, but uh, had a couple te technical difficulties. I'll show you the output here. So when I put momentum into this, and I, I just pulled this up uh, you know, day before yesterday, so it'd be very similar results. Um, putting momentum into the mix improved the results here. So we're seeing nearly 30% annualized top bottom decile spreads here now. Uh, you also see that the top fractile, top 20%, 
is uh, greatly outperforming the overall universe. Where this is really saving you, uh, to UN's point recently, just a minute ago, in terms of risk mitigation, um, we're especially getting value from that bottom quintile. So these would be the stocks that you would avoid if you're a long-only manager, those value traps, those companies with dangerous balance sheets and other things. Um, it's down 19.14%, you know, so dramatically underperforming both the index returns and the equal weighted returns. Right. So uh, this multi-factor model is one that I think I can have some confidence in. Uh, so I'm going to uh, try to build this now live in ICON. Uh, if we have problems, of course, I have some screenshots we can fall back on. But I'll try sharing that screen. And hopefully you'll be able to see this in just a moment. Sorry, there is always a bit of a delay as it uh, switches over to screen share mode. There you go, Tim. It's there. Okay, great. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, so be before I put in this multi-factor model based on the back test I just ran, uh, I'm going to put in a few filters first. So I'm looking again at S&P 500. You can make this whatever investable universe seems appropriate to you, including a customized list. Then I'm going to screen out the companies with the lowest earnings quality. And earnings quality, by our measure, it, it builds on the accruals anomaly that I mentioned BGI pioneered. Uh, this is looking at the sustainability of a company's sources of earnings. So some are more sustainable than others, accruals, being the unsustainable part, uh, companies whose transactions, revenues, and earnings are backed by underlying free cash flow is the sustainable part. So within this list, I want to avoid value traps. And so I'm going to uh, look for companies with more sustainable earnings, eliminating the bottom 25%. I'm also going to screen out the most dangerous companies in terms of default risk, bankruptcy risk, companies that may be slashing dividends at risk of bankruptcies, those that came into an economic downturn with bloated over leveraged balance sheets. So we have a several ways of looking at credit risk, uh, the default risk. And so we also have a combined model here that outperforms all of those. I'll eliminate the most dangerous 25% of those. Um, I want companies that are sustainable, not just in the short term, but also over the long term. So I'm going to look at ESG scores and eliminate those in the bottom half. <clears throat> I'm also looking at uh, a Starmine predicted surprise measure. Uh, what that is, is it's a uh, proprietary reweighting of the consensus estimate. So the consensus, the IBIS mean, is just an equal weighted average of every analyst estimate on a per company basis. Uh, we find that if you uh, over, overweight the more recent estimates by the more accurate analysts, you get a more uh, accurate estimate than the consensus. And the difference between the consensus and the smart estimate, we call this predicted surprise. So before every earnings season, we stick our necks out, we publish five we expect to beat, five we expect to miss as they report, and we do that by region. And uh, there's been really performing well lately. So in Europe, we got 10 for 10, 100% directionally correct. Those that we said would beat did, those we said would disappoint did. Uh, we got nine for 10 in the US, uh, North America, uh, US and Canada, and we got eight for 10 in Asia with all five of the negative predicted surprise correct. Uh, so as another risk mitigation tool, uh, we don't want to be popping a stock into a portfolio that we expect have a high probability. We find that's at least 70% um, of missing. So I'm going to screen out those that have a predicted surprise, um, you know, below minus 2%. So we're left with 194 stocks. Now I'm going to use the multi-factor ranking feature to screen on the companies 
that do best on our model that we just built. So here, go into the ranking feature. If I just add a number of other filters, you know, I end up with something that, uh, you know, returns you know, 10 stocks or something. You put in filter after filter and keep eliminating companies. So instead I'm using this multi-factor ranking feature, much like a clunch would have done, but again, you can do this as just a desktop user. So I'm putting in the analyst revisions model. We put that into our back test. Earnings quality, price momentum, and a measure of growth. I'm using the advantage of the smart estimate, which we build on a number of things, the sell side analyst forecast, not just EPS, but things like revenue. So looking at their forecast uh, for this year versus last year, again, overweighting the more accurate analyst and the more recent forecasts. So higher is better across all these measures. And so here is our customized multi-factor rank. Um, see at the top of the list at C, um, I guess people are spending a lot of time in front of video games this year. So Activism Blizzard is doing well. Uh, so it's up 5% year to date. Um, a few pharmaceutical companies, um, you see Clorox on the list. Um, so let's pick one of these here. Um, so maybe one that hasn't already more than doubled year to date. Uh, I'm kind of drawn to Lowe's. So of these high rank companies, Lowe's also has a combined alpha model rank, which we know is hard to outperform. From 92, we've got a 99 out of 100 in earnings quality. Although it's up 32% year to date, you know, it's got a price to earnings estimate that's below the others here in the top of the list. Uh, good growth numbers. I might have picked Best Buy too. It's also only has a 15.42% PE ratio. Um, unlike, you know, the 49% that or 49 times that PayPal has. Uh, I'll use as a tiebreaker the fact that Lowe's is growing faster and has a higher ESG score. So now it's easy to apply that human overlay, drill down into a company's fundamentals. See how Lowe's has been doing recently. So looking at its recent reporting results, we see that they recently reported Q2, uh, July quarter. Uh, the consensus was 295. Lowe's came in at $3.75, so 27% upside surprise. Notice the Starmine Smart Estimate was higher than consensus on the day it reported at 3.12, uh, so that it was directionally correct. So Lowe's has been doing well. Uh, a couple of big positive earnings surprises here in the last few quarters. Um, let's look at some of the financial fundamentals. So drilling into earnings quality for a minute. So these are really fast ways to get up to speed on a company that maybe you haven't looked at recently. So here's the earnings quality history score over time. You can see the stock price performance nicely outperforming. Green is generally good. Um, companies in the top side get bright green numbers. Um, those with low scores, uh, berry signals, we mark with red. So you can see Lowe's is getting a 99 out of 100. So the top 2% uh, relative to every other company in North America. And it's, it's good across every component here. So we, you know, we don't build black boxes. We show you what goes into our model construction and make this very transparent. Uh, so you can see here 92 in accruals, 98 in cash flow, 99 in operating efficiency. You know, if you're a quant, we make these things visible in feeds as well, so you can take our models apart and put them back together again. Um, let's look at cash flow. So if you hover over any of these categories, you'll see that we have dozens of financial fundamental charts 
So here I'm looking at cash flow. Let's look at free cash flow relative to operations. You know, if I'm picking out a, a stock to stick into a portfolio right now, I want one that's generating uh, enough free cash flow to be self-funding. So they don't have to do things like a dilutive rights offering or slash a dividend. Um, here we see that lately, Lowe's has been a massive free cash flow generator. So the green portion shows the amount by which free cash flow exceeds reported net income here in white. So in the most recent quarter, almost $7 billion in free cash flow versus 2.8 uh, in reported net income. Uh, you can also look at things like margins and returns. That's our definition of operating efficiency. So here I'm looking at a return on net operating assets uh, relative to the sector median, moving in opposite directions. So you can see that consumer discretionary has seen a downturn in its returns while Lowe's is seeing a rapid acceleration. You know, we can drill down to the individual components of ROA, looking at profit margins or asset turnover. Again, you see the divergence here. The Lowe's has become a lot more efficient in turning a dollar of assets into a dollar of net income or operating income. Well, there's a few things we can do there. We look at what analysts' opinions have done to reflect you know, these recent positive surprises and uh, turns in cash flows. Uh, we see here that uh, our measure of analyst revisions, un unlike the traditional plot factor, which would just look at change in EPS over the last, say, 30 days, uh, we look across the income statement, not only at EPS, but also EBITDA and revenue. Uh, we don't look just at the current period, but we look, in addition to this quarter, the full fiscal year estimates, uh, next year's estimates, and we also take into consideration the smart estimate uh, and the predicted surprise. Uh, we also look at change in analyst recommendations. So they haven't been uh, moving their recommendations up aggressively, but they have been moving up their estimates. So uh, blended changes here over multiple look back periods uh, in EPS, EBITDA and revenue, not just for this quarter, but for the full year and for next year. So analyst sentiment is uh, you know, improving very positive here. And I'd say that Lowe's looks good across a number of measures. You can find star mine models in ICON here in a number of ways. Uh, we sort by bullish or bearish. So no bearish, that's good. I can look at all the models. So here you can check out our credit risk models too as a means of risk mitigation. Um, so you can see the combined alpha model score is good. So as value momentum, you can drill into any of these. You can also find them as I have, you know, under these pull down tabs, or there's this combined alpha model. That's what CAM up here stands for. Uh, we can drill into that or the combined credit risk model. And you find the various components here and all of the sub components that feed into these models. So here we're showing the history for combined alpha model. It's improved nicely for lows. Uh, we can see it compared to its uh, direct peers, competitors. Uh, we're transparent about the weights that we put on each of these income uh, components. And you can see here with the drill down of all the, the alpha models that we've created and their scores for lows. So you see a lot of green here, which is a, a bullish sign. Uh, so we can kind of go through that list that came up in the top ranks of our multi-factor screener. Um, but I think that'll give you a sense how you can go from an observation of what's working really well now in the market uh, to actually drilling down on a few individual companies. So um, thank you very much. I, I think with that, we should uh, turn it over to some questions. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Tim. Yeah, so there's uh, several questions that have come in. Um, and we have about 15 minutes, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll attempt to get through as many of them um, as we can. Um, so the first one um, says, uh, do you think due to high frequency trading and robotics, the quantitative analysis is not as relevant as it used to be? 
Ideally, the company valuation is a reflection of the future earnings, but for example, Tesla at 900 times price earnings is perhaps unrealistic. Maybe Tim or Yuen, do you want to comment there? No, I'll, I'll give it a shot and then uh, see if Yuen has any observations. You know, certainly in terms of like decoupling with fundamentals, you know, price earnings ratios like that are a, a bit difficult to defend based on uh, current or visible future earnings. Um, so I don't think it's driven by high frequency traders. Um, I think high frequency traders are often um, trading on retail flows ahead of those. Um, you know, I think a lot of this is being driven by speculation, a lot of that by retailing. Um, you know, we've seen uh, the number of new accounts opened at uh, TD Ameritrade uh, has skyrocketed since the first of the year. Um, you know, you've got, um, you know, other retail platforms out there that have seen enormous growth, um, you know, Robinhood, for example. Um, so is that it? Um, I don't trade retail. <laughs> um, so we've seen, you know, massive growth in that. There's probably an element of speculation, you know, trend following strategies. We'll see the momentum in stocks like Tesla and probably, you know, pile on as well. Um, so I don't think it's forever changed the fact that fundamentals matter, uh, but there certainly has been a decoupling and we've seen massive, you know, underperformance of value strategies recently. Part of that, I think, is a sector bias. You know, if you were to run a screen on, you know, like the cheapest stocks by PE or our valuation models, uh, you'll see a, a lot of financial sector companies bubble to the top. A lot of energy companies look cheap. Um, but I think that market participants accurately get it, you know, that they are probably cheap for a reason. Great. Yeah, I, um, I, thank I think that if I could just add to that, um, I think that a lot of the um, you know, traditional quant factors that are being used right now are, are very much historical and accounting based. Um, those aren't really you know, well captured in, in today's type of environment where um, a, a lot of chasing for hyper, you know, growth uh, stocks um, with great, great high, high expectations. Um, and and so uh, we, we have to be more flexible in how we define, I guess, value. Um, you know, value is... Uh, is now maybe viewed upon more differently, but I don't. I don't think I agree with uh, Tim here in that I don't think fundamentals have changed. I mean, a business, you know, is a business. A good business is a good business, um, and uh, we 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 just have to assess it um, according to the markets uh, and the sector that it's in. Yeah, I like that point. Uh, you know, because if we look at how quality is performing. You know, I'm encouraged that quality is still performing really well here, uh, one of our top three factors. And so, you know, companies that are still kicking off lots of free cash flow, with good margins, uh, sustainable returns, uh, those are also being rewarded by the market. So I agree with you. It may be that we need to think about how we define value. Great. Okay, thank you. Um... So another question, um, for black swan events, is it true that all of these models are irrelevant? Yes or, or no? Uh, it depends what kind of black swan. Uh, you know, on an individual company level, no, these are highly relevant, especially things like our credit risk models. Uh, we caught all of the most recent um, highly visible bankruptcies, you know, Sears, JC Penney, um, uh, winning petroleum, um, you know, you name it. Um, they've been showing up in our credit risk models with a score of one, the bottom 1%. Uh, we call it Hertz. Um, you know, Norwegian Air showed up as uh, a dangerous one. We caught um, uh, Thomas Cook in Europe. Uh, so, you know, those kind of individual company black swan events, uh, you know, we were able to catch quantitatively. In terms of things like, you know, an economic downturn caused by a, a lockdown due to a pandemic, um, of course, there's no way to model that. But having having said that, um, you know, what, what we had observed 
uh, even though the entire market uh, was down um, globally, uh, that actually, if you look inside uh, underneath the, the, the sectors, you'll actually find quite a wide dispersion of returns. And that, it's a really great time for active management in that sense, uh, because you can really show off your stock selection skills. But at the top level, if you're looking at factors, yes, I agree, the factor correlations would be quite high when, um, you know, because of all the fear. But it doesn't mean that there's no place that you can invest or find good names. In fact, that this is these, this is the right buying conditions because you can get in at reasonable cheap prices for great quality names. Yes, and I'd say with um, you know the high degree of uncertainty in the markets right now, not only in terms of you know global pandemic, economic returns, but also you know things like you know presidential election coming up, uh, all kinds mm -hmm. of uh, possible outcomes. We can't know what kind of black swan is lurking out there. But I'd say it's a good time to position your portfolio uh, so that it can, uh, you know, sustain any kind of shock, you know, to the system. And, and that's where some of these models seem to be uh, really shining right now. Okay, thank you. Um, so this next question, it's, I think it's a, a bit of a two-part question. So I'll, I'll read the first part. Um, it appears price momentum always seems to work as other factors work at various times in the economic cycle. So first, is that true, um, is the first part of the question. And then the second part is, is, is shorter time horizon rather than like a 12, is a six or a three month time horizon rather than a 12 month time horizon um, better? Hmm. Okay, so to the first part, um, we found that it, as we back test our data over a long period of time, let's say going back to 98, uh, that momentum and value signals have negative correlation. So generally when momentum is working, uh, valuation is, is not, uh, as we see right now in the extreme. Um, but at other times, say so after the dot-com bubble burst, uh, we saw the, the exact opposite. So momentum failed catastrophically with huge drawdowns, um, but value stocks greatly outperformed. So one nice thing about building these combination models is you can kind of cancel out the extremes of those two. So you don't have to figure out when is momentum going to stop working and when values might start to revert to the mean. Uh, just turning on the combination and leaving it on in a static combination seems to smooth that out, giving you better sharp ratios, you know, risk-adjusted returns. Um, and I'm sorry, um, can you repeat part two? Uh, yeah, part two is about the, the time frame. Is a, a three- or a six-month oh, yeah. time frame um, more effective than like a 12-month or longer time frame? So when we built these models, we kind of optimized it for about a six-month holding period. We know that other investment styles vary from you know much shorter to much longer. Uh, so one nice thing about that back testing tool that I showed you is you know you can put in your own time frame. Uh, you can rebalance uh, when it's sort of more appropriate to your investment or trading style, um, and it will vary. So we find that if you have a shorter holding period, uh, momentum works better. Uh, things like quality and valuation are more of a longer term reversion to the mean signal. Uh, so you'd place more weight on momentum. Uh, if you have a longer time horizon, you want to invest for at least two years, you place more weight on the slower moving signals and, and lower the weight on momentum or some of those trending signals like analyst revisions. Uh, that, that's exactly right. I will, I will agree with that. Um, that's exactly uh, what, what we do. We look at our time horizon, our investment horizon. Um, we have a quality bias uh, in our approach. And so um, the, the price momentum piece is actually uh, along the horizon. It actually works quite well, um, very complementary to the other type, you know, valuation slash quality type signals we might be using in our, uh, in our models. Um, and the, the lower the correlation, actually, um, just adding to the, the first part of the question, is there cyclicality in the signals? I think 
think is what you're asking. The answer is yes, we see that, we see that quite a lot. And uh, when you add uh, these factors, um, and they're not very uh, correlated to one another, uh, which is what uh, Tim is alluding to, um, that actually typically works well, because it also means in quantitative terms that there's actually additional insight and information in those signals. Great, thank you, Wynn. Um, so I'll go on to uh, to another question. We have about five more minutes, so um, I think we can we can get a few more in here. Um, so this question is: Is cherry picking stocks more lucrative than playing the whole market with data modeling? Well, I guess it depends on whose hands it's it's in. Uh, you know, we all know on average that active management has uh, struggled to outperform buying holding a passive instrument like uh, s p 500 index um but uh you know like you and said earlier you know i think it's active managers time to shine right now uh, because uh there's less correlation in stock price performance you know one security to the next and so when you see this huge dispersion of returns you know from very you know doubling and tripling since the beginning of the year versus those that are still down you know 50 percent um, it, it should be stock pickers' uh, time to, to do a good job of cherry picking those, but uh, we'll, we'll see. I also want to add, though, that um, you know, uh, the, it, it is really still really important to consider these models in your in your um, in your everyday analysis to help you. Um, you know, the, the the strengths of quant is that it's able to basically explain um, in very simple mathematical terms. Uh, what the it's just trying to capture the what's you know bits of, of world reality so to speak, um, and uh, and there's actually a relationship there to stock price returns. So when you look at kind of your universe, certainly in our universe, we have a very very huge number of companies, like hundreds of thousands. Um, you need some way of filtering down, and to the extent that something like a like a, a QA point here or Icon can help you, uh, you know, I and we have our own uh, proprietary. Uh, uh, set of models that we build as well, um, it can really point you at least to the right direction of where you should be looking at. Your battering average actually immediately increases. However, it never replaces having fundamental uh, analysis on top of that because the models are, are really designed to just capture a few things, um, and that's what it's very good at inconsistently. But the analysts are really good at providing common sense and narratives, you know, making sense of the numbers and really studying the future cash flows of these companies. The models aren't able to do that well, at least not yet. And I think that's a great point. You know, humans can look at things like, you know, the probability of a, um, you know, new product release being, uh, you know, broadly accepted. Is there an upgrade cycle coming in phones or, you know, whatever? And, um, you know, models still can't do things like that. So. Uh, if I were to look at my screen and toggle to the, instead of sorting from the highest ranks to the lowest, where there's all those, you know, large appreciations in price uh, year to date, you would have seen the opposite. You would have seen a sea of red, companies that are down and still down on the year. So it is doing a good job of sorting the universe. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so maybe we have time for one more. And there was, I, I thank everybody for, for all the questions. So there, were, there are going to be several that we have not gotten to. Um, but again, we will absolutely be sure that we get your question answered um, via email. But uh, uh, Tim and, and Yuan, I'll just take, I'll just read out one more if that's okay. Um, can you discuss your thoughts on how to weight factors when building a multi-factor stock model? For example, would the weights of each factor differ in different sectors? And is there a better way than just equal weighting? Uh, yeah, sure, you can improve on an equal weight. Uh, I did that just for simplicity and demonstrations today. Uh, but ideally, you would um, you know, test it uh, based on your region. Uh, like you can, uh, if you recall that combined alpha model screenshot I showed, um, we have a optimized uh, weight for each model based on uh, how it performed its region. So as I, I mentioned earlier, momentum works better in emerging markets, um, valuation works better in Japan. Um, 
So yeah, you would. Um, now the danger is overfitting. So if you just run regression analysis after regression analysis to come up with model weights and what worked the very best over some historical time period, uh, you may end up sort of fooling yourself with an overfitted uh, model. Um, I know you would be an expert in this area. Well, we did a lot of studies in the past um, on on sort of you know dynamic weighting and and uh, different weightings in different industries and sectors, et cetera. But we, I think, what we ultimately found uh, was that um, something somewhere close to equal weighting is actually the best. And then use uh, you know sensibility really to to make a, a a judgment as to why you think you might want to slightly tilt the weight. Um, but in general, uh, you're best keeping to something very uh, generic, um, and then and then use uh, your your fundamental analysis and fundamental like, intuition almost to figure out what uh, you know what makes the most sense when it comes to uh, doing your analysis, your fundamental analysis. Okay. Very good. Um, so I see we're we are one minute one minute over the hour. Um, I would like to thank everybody for joining our webinar, and a particular thank you to Tim Gammer at UN for their participation today. Um, again, we will send the slides. Um, you will receive a link to the recording, and for the several questions that we didn't get to, again, we will be sure that we uh, reach you directly with answers. Thank you very much for joining us today um, and the webinar is now complete. Thank you.